evening. Uh, it's, it is my happy duty to welcome you to these premises for the 10th Annual National Symposium of the Society. I thought of having our Dean Guido Calabresi piped in from Florence where he is right now, but it is after his head time. So uh, I, I will give remarks. It's quite fitting that uh, you hold some kind of 10th birthday party here at Yale Law School, for it was here, as you know, that uh, a group of students and faculty brought the society into being a decade ago. I guess, therefore, the LS girl should claim to uh, claim to be the cradle of liberty. <laughs> 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 uh, it is also fitting, very clever of you all, to have picked March 1 to begin the symposium, for as I'm sure you knew, today is the 210th anniversary of the ratification of the Articles of Confederation, which I think is the truly authentic charter of the federal society. When <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Leto asked me to warm up the crowd this evening, I asked him if I should say anything substantive and or thoughtful, and uh, he said, in effect, that wouldn't be necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then I worry about two things. First, how to keep uh, going for long enough to let the crowd come back for dinner and settle down. It's uh, before it was Judge Witter's turn to speak. It's the equivalent to keeping uh, the timeout going long enough for a football game to get through the long commercials. Uh, I thought it was a joke. Uh, I, I have in my job, I work in various and sundry meetings to the law school. This is my second one today. And I try to have good jokes. Uh, there was a sentencing meeting this morning, and I told some sentencing jokes. Uh, last week, I went to a big conference here on genocide. <laughs> That's true. I had some really good, I had some really good uh, genocide jokes. <laughs> but they were, they were awesomely tasteless. And uh, I realized they would offend 93% of the L community and uh, end my acting deanship immediately. Now uh, that was uh, quite tempting, but I persisted. <laughs> so now I do have a set here of uh, jokes that are marvelously appropriate for taste, uh, they're, they're tasteless, I mean they're tasty. <laughs> uh, for this occasion, appropriate for the federal society. They are from a genre called separation of powers jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe some other time. Now uh, uh, my, my second worry was uh, that about losing my credentials uh, as a card-carrying non-federalist, uh, a reputation I sullied briefly in 1987 by testifying in the Senate on behalf of one of the society's own founding fathers, uh, but which is otherwise intact. But then I looked at the wide spectrum of views and idiosyncrasies represented by the speakers here today and tomorrow, really a, a splendidly diversified portfolio, and I mean that. And I was relieved. It was easy. Uh, I could defend myself as a non-federalist by saying I really come here to raise the flag for, for example, for Bruce Ackerman or Owen Piss or someone like that, and I would uh, maintain my non-federalist status. But indeed, if this symposium is uh, what the Federalist Society is all about, uh, then uh, sign me up. In any event, this brief chore uh, gives me the short and heady, but heady taste of being uh, having been briefly at the very center of power. <laughs> That's uh, surely where we are now. It is not every intellectual association that gets anointed by a sitting president of the United States. And it is not every law and public policy symposium that gets another president of the United States to do what Mr. Bush did Wednesday night when he shut down the war just in time to provide a kinder, a kinder gentler background for this intellectual feast. Well, by the way, I, when I was preparing these remarks, I looked over the your pamphlet and read that one of the three principles of the society is that it is emphatically the promise and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what the law should be. I'm impressed with emphatic duties, and so I figured that perhaps I should tonight provide you with a manual of how to tell a what the law is judged from a what the law should be judged. I prepared such a manual, but, but perhaps some other time. <laughs> <laughs> because right now the, uh, the 
commercials are over, the timeout is over, we're about to resume play, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to my faculty colleague of about 23, 24 years, my old friend and a splendid judge, the Honorable Ralph Cable. I persuaded them 
uh, by my eloquent arguments uh, on behalf of freedom of expression. Uh, I regret that I came away with the strong impression that the threat of a lawsuit, the publicity, and maybe even losing the lawsuit had a greater effect. <laughs> In the course of this, I heard not even a whispered word of encouragement from the members of this faculty who were my friends and were usually quite vocal, where issues of freedom of expression are concerned. When the Federalist Society was in the process of formation, Things were somewhat calmer, although I, I, I still remember very vividly one of the students who was involved asking me if I thought Yale would somehow retaliate against them. Uh, there's no question that it was a climate in which conservative views were, viewed, were, were felt to be objectionable. And there was a considerable amount of hissing of conservative students, those who would reveal themselves in class, uh, once in a while, with what seemed to be the silent approval of the professor. I'm happy to say that when Guido met with student organizations and became dean and asked them what they objected to, he was appalled to hear this from the Federalist Society members and it stopped. I was also shocked to learn over the years how many students had gone to the Yale Law School, and, and this was no different than other institutions back in those years, and have felt obliged to conceal their political views and wound up in the Reagan administration. <laughs> And it seems to me an example, and I say this to conservatives, uh, the fact that it has grown remarkably shows the need for all of us to foster free expression and tolerance. Uh, it is really an example of how semi closed societies can be transformed by allowing new thoughts to be aired uh, and to allow a competition of ideas. I will say that one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career has to do with advice that I gave the students when they were forming it, and they hate to have me keep saying that I can remember the time when the entire Federalist Society fit in my office and there were chairs left over. <laughs> Uh, but there was one group of students who wanted to make it uh, a, a, an organization for political agitation. And I advised them, and there was another group who agreed and prevailed, that they should really devote themselves to encouraging an exchange of ideas. Uh, that they should hold meetings like this one where whatever the views of the people who run the Federalist Society are concerned, you have a spectrum of views that are presented uh, and the audience can sit and listen. But really, there is no inconsistency between conservative ideology and civil liberties. A touchstone of conservative, conservative ideology is the fear of government because government has a monopoly of power. The Bill of Rights is an attempt to limit government <coughs> in the exercise of power, and certainly to that extent, they are conservative idea. Now it is true that there is nothing in conservative thought that teaches what weight certain rights ought to be given when in conflict with other constitutional values. But it is hardly a 
a departure from conservative ideology or from the Constitution for a judge to view detention before trial or the seizure of a business or all of the property of a criminal defendant solely on the basis of an indictment for a judge to view that with great grave concern. As to this latter point, I'm defending myself before I get reversed again. <laughs> the quintessential laissez-faire provision of the Constitution is, in my view, not to take any fraud, but the First Amendment. And the greatest danger to First Amendment theory today is not to debate over obscenity or flag burning, but to view that speech may be regulated in the name of political equality. I once wrote in regard to the argument that speech should be regulated in the name of political equality, that rarely has so sinister a proposition been so attractively packaged. Uh, but the fact is, if you can limit speech to silence political communication in the name of equality, political communication will sooner or later not be free and will cease. We have already done that in the area of campaign financing. Uh, over my prone body. Uh, <laughs> not a considerable diary of people. But the logic of the rationale that underlies that regulation can be limited. Uh, for example, all issue groups, whether they be on the right, uh, uh, all communicate on matters of public interest in a fashion that give them far more power than well over 99% of our population. Substantial inequalities in political communication are simply ubiquitous in our society. In the silencing of one powerful voice, will just make the next most powerful voice seem even greater and then it is silence, and so forth. Every person or group engaging in effective political communication is automatically subject to an accusation of too much power, of needing to be regulated in the name of political equality. And who is it? That will decide who has too much power and who must be limited in the name of political equality. Why, of course, it's government, the most powerful of all communicators. That's why I think that the logic of regulating speech in the name of political equality must ultimately and logically, and when something logically does something, it will ultimately lead to a governmentally imposed silence. Political communication is not effective unless unequal. And that is why the First Amendment singles out the press with special protection. The press isn't singled out because it's weak. The press is singled out because it is uniquely powerful. And it is uniquely private and it is uniquely a counterweight to government. The logic of regulating in the name of political equality seems to be ultimately to call for government to regulate the press. I know this reliance upon the effort and intent of the framers is this inconsistent with the notion of a growing constitution ever evolving, and it is precisely my fear uh, that the Constitution may well evolve um, and grow in that direction. Uh, but I urge you all to consider, uh, and conservatives in particular, uh, about 
the importance of civil liberties in our life, and I uh, wish you and uh, the Bill of Rights a, a happy anniversary. Let me suggest 
three spheres or levels of decision making that affect how people lead their lives. At the most basic level is the private sphere. This is the realm of individual choice, private contract, and personal liberty. The decision maker is the individual. I am going to live in this neighborhood. I've decided I am going to marry this person. I've decided I'm going to educate my children in this way. I'm going to buy that hat. And on and on. This is the most basic level of decision making. Now, for all these self referring individuals to live together peacefully and to pursue their own private happiness meaningfully, there must be a second decision making level the level of civil government, the political sphere. The Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution remind us that it is precisely the need to protect individual liberty that calls into being civil government. Here, at the government level, is lodged the decision-making process which makes and enforces the rules that apply to private choices at level one. There are, I think, two axes along which governments at this second level may run. And these axes are interrelated. The first axis represents the degree of community participation in decision making. This can run from absolute monarchy to, let's say, direct democracy. The second axis represents the degree to which the government, whatever it's for, is authorized to, to restrict, supplant, reverse, or remove private choice. On this axis, the potential intrusiveness of government can run the gap. It can be the most limited, laissez-faire, libertarian government designed to protect the broadest range of private choice and individual liberty. On the other hand, it can be the most all-encompassing Orwellian government, which controls virtually every aspect of life, and which leaves very little room for private choice. I think most political theorists would agree on the relationship between these two acts. The more a government community, the more a community participates in government decision making, the more authority it can be trusted with, and the less the risk it will unduly intrude in the private sphere. And the converse is true. Now there is a third level of decision making, and this is the constitutional level. The level at which constitutional rules are framed, which are binding on and enforceable against the government itself. Constitutional rules are a way to control, directly or indirectly, the extent to which the political sphere is permitted to intervene in the private sphere. Constitutional rules can be set at this third level, which control the reach of government indirectly by setting rules of structure or procedure. <coughs> Constitutional rules can also control the range of government action directly. Substantive rules can secure private rights by restraining the government from acting in certain ways. For example, the government cannot abridge freedom of speech. That is a restraint. That is a constitutional rule which binds the government and restrains it from acting and intervening in the private sphere in a particular way. Theoretically, also, constitutional rules can create another kind of private right or entitlement by affirmatively requiring the government to take action. Every citizen is hereby guaranteed an education, says the Constitution. That is a rule at the constitutional level which compels the government to intervene in the private sphere in some way. Now let's turn to our federal constitution. As we all know, the proposed Constitution that emerged from the Convention of 1787 did not contain the Bill of Rights. The Federalists generally believe that as far as the federal government was concerned, a Bill of Rights, a set of constitutional rules protecting rights by restraining the government, was unnecessary. In general, the Federalists 
did want to limit the extent to which the federal government would intervene in the private sphere. They wanted to protect private liberty. But they sought to do this essentially through structural rules, not by specific direct restraints on government action. Thus, they sought to structure the political decision-making process at level two in a way that reduced the threat of undue intrusion into level one by creating a sound representative system of government with limited enumerated powers, with the distribution and the separation of powers, with an independent judiciary. The framers sought to limit the threat that the federal government posed to individual liberties. The federalists or most of them deprecated <coughs> the Bill of Rights as, mere, as a mere parchment barrier. And they often argued, as Publius asserted in Federalist Number 84, that the Constitution is itself, in every rational sense, and to every useful purpose, a Bill of Rights. By this they meant that the Constitution <coughs> secured rights because it was derived from the people themselves. It provided for a sound system of representative government, and it granted limited powers to a balanced and mixed government. Thus, the Constitution that emerged from the Philadelphia Convention contained few direct restraints on the reach of government. As long as the federal government acted pursuant to one of the enumerated powers, there were few formal barriers to its intrusion into the private sphere. We know the history. The consensus emerged that structural safeguards were not enough. Indirect controls on the reach of federal government alone were not sufficient to protect freedoms. The Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, were adopted in 1791. That is a set of constitutional rules that were agreed to at level three, which directly restrained the extent to which the political process at level two could intrude upon the realm of private choice and individual liberty at level one. Such direct restraints, binding on the government, require some enforcement institution. The institution we have developed is judicial review. So we have courts largely insulated from the political process, applying constitutional rules to restrain and control government action. A basic issue we are confronting tonight and which a number of panels, I believe, will touch upon tomorrow is this. Committed as we are to effective representative government and securing a wide range of individual liberty, how should decision making about our lives be allocated among these three decision making levels? What kind of decision should we seek to reserve the private sphere at level one? And how should we protect them? When we have established a balanced representative government at level two, what is the range of decision it should be allowed to make? To what extent should we give representative government latitude in this decision making? How far should we defer to the majority? And finally, to what extent should we set specific constitutional rules at level three to interdict the decisions of record of the representative political process? The key insight of the Federalists was that there are costs associated with packing protections into level three in the form of constitutional restraints wielded against representative government by courts. Do we necessarily become more free? And do our freedoms become more secure the more we pack constitutional constraints on level three? As Publius observed in Federalist Number 51, in framing government, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the government, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. As this suggests, we have two goals which are somewhat intentional. On the one hand, we want effective civil government, because effective government is essential to secure in any individual liberty. But an unconstrained government, even a representative one, can threaten the liberties is an established to protect. And yet, as we impose direct restraints on representative government, we run the risk of inhibiting government's effectiveness. 
and that's the risk of losing important freedoms. So for example, the more procedural constraints we pile on the government as it attempts to perform its police function, the less able the government becomes at performing its primary function of protecting the security of persons and property. Further, going overboard and tackling restraints into level three as constitutional rules tends to place the individual in an adversarial relationship with his representative. <clears throat> this undermines both the individual's sense of belonging to a community and the ability of the government to embody and express the community's values. Instead of a self-governing community, we may become a collection of Rousseau's noble savages with no meaningful bond to one another. At that point, we will have lost any meaningful individual rights to another end, not to government, but to licentiousness. Publius warned, liberty may be endangered by abuses of liberty as well as by the abuses of power, and the former rather than the latter is apparently more to be apprehended by the United States in the United States. Another Federalist observed at the time, there is no quarrel between government and liberty. The war is between government and licentiousness. In short, the Federalists tended to believe there was too much jealousy of power and too little willingness to repose proper confidence in one's own government. With that general framework, let me introduce Professor Epstein, who will discuss whether there is any such thing as a non-fundamental right. And no one should be surprised if Professor Epstein would seek to reserve as much decision-making authority within the private sphere and would rely heavily on constitutional restraints at the constitutional level to restrict the role of government. Well, thank you, Bob, for making my speech with me. I'm going to pass the microphone over to somebody else. I'm not quite sure I'm going to stick with the topic as it was announced, but I would probably deviate at least in some small degree from the things that were said, part of the response to what Ralph Winter said in an effort to try to figure out what the relationship is between various forms of crime. But I do think that the question here is really a very important one. The title of the panel is absolutely factious. And the question is, should the Bill of Rights fully protect fundamental freedoms? You know what all those terms mean. To give an answer, though, is both perverse on the one hand and odious on the other. So <laughs> the real question that we wish to ask is, can we identify a class of fundamental freedoms that are worth protecting? And can we figure out mechanisms that might be able to protect them fully? So in trying to do this, there is, I think, a very dangerous sentiment that sometimes is brought up the land that we can, by the appellation fundamental, draw a distinction between two classes of rights, those which are in some sense robust and those of which should be regarded as more frail and less powerful and less, and less amenable to constitutional protection. Oddly enough, as much as I agree with Ralph Winter, I think he fell into that particular trap in his very pointed remarks when he indicated he was going to put aside the protection of property on the one hand and was going to concentrate with respect to the freedom of speech on the theory that that is the best, perhaps the only way available in which we can constrain the monopoly of power, which is otherwise residing in government. What I'm going to try to do is to take a very different approach to the situation. And the first thing it seems to me is that if you're going to look at fundamental rights, you do want to have a list, but you darn well have better keep the list very short. There is nothing more dangerous to intellectual discourse than the rapid proliferation of particularistic rights aimed at certain individuals and certain causes in the hopes that therefore you can protect your darlings and leave everybody else to the perils of the political process. And if I were to ask what would be the list of things that I would put on my rights, I think I would go to the 14th Amendment, change a few terms here and there, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> this is not a course in the Federalists, it's basically a free association. That's what I'm talking about, right, of course, but I didn't have to say so. But we talk about life, liberty, and property, which I think the most difficult of the two of them are liberty and property. And what it seems to me is that starting with two very small rights, at least in terms of the list, what you could do is generate an enormous theory which will essentially give you a very comprehensive view about the way in which individuals ought to relate to the state. That is, when I start to speak of liberty, I mean liberty of action. And that would include not only the physical ability to move about here and there, but also a question of liberty with respect to contract and liberty with respect to speech. 
Essentially, it seems to be dealing with liberty of starting with the lofty intuition that each individual owns his labor, and you're trying to figure out exactly what ownership of labor gives you in terms of cash value relative to other people in the world. And the other half of the thing that we're going to worry about, of course, is going to be liberty, is not liberty, but it's property. It's the question of what are those things that you can reduce to ownership, and more importantly, what are the bundle of rights associated once that ownership is acquired by the individual. And if you're reasonably astute about the way that you understand property, it turns out it's that it covers not only the right to exclude, at least presumptively, but it would also cover here all sorts of rights having to do with use of respect to alienation, so that between the two sets of rights, you could, if you could devise a system of enforcement of level two and level three, figure out how you can structure a very wide and comprehensive way arrangements amongst individuals. Now, in dealing with these rights, it's important to, I think, know a couple of things about them. The purpose of a set of rights is not only to specify the relationships amongst individuals so that they can figure out what the boundaries are one to another and how they're able to interact. It's also, it seems to me, to stress the interaction that takes place between individuals on the one hand and government on the other hand. I think Ralph Winter is dead right when he says that the dominant animation behind the theory of freedom of speech is that the government has a monopoly and the only way will check powers to protect other institutions which are private on the one hand and powerful on the other. The point that I would disagree with him on is the question as to whether or not you could do that through speech alone without having some independent fantasy to protect to property rights more generally. And I am somewhat skeptical about that. I think what happens is if you put too much weight with respect to one particular constitutional barrier, it will be overrun because you will have a magical line situation in which all your fortifications are built at one point in the process and none are available anywhere else. So if you were to ask me, for example, how I would want to protect freedom of speech, I would say it doesn't begin at the time that the newspaper starts to begin to publish its various words. I would think in the alternative, it comes to the question of how it is it picks the site on which it wants to locate its plant, and how it's going to determine who's going to work for it. And if it doesn't have freedom with respect to property and the acquisition of land, lease, and so forth, and if it can't fire its union members because they're protected by the National Labor Relations Act, you have to expect these limitations on freedom of speech, which are much more insidious and much more powerful, notwithstanding the very picturesque and florid rhetoric which are given about the importance of the press as an institution in order to check government. And it seems to me that one can carry this over to other areas as well. If one were to try to talk, for example, about questions of religious liberty, I think it's a very dangerous strategy to say, uh huh, what we're going to do is we're going to protect religion and religious liberty because they're something special, and therefore they have the normal abilities to figure out who they're going to associate with, and of course they can own the property on which their triggers are going to be imposed, are going to be erected, and so forth. It's not that I'm against these things with respect to religions, but when you cast it as a case of religious liberty as opposed to a case of liberty generally, you then always run into the establishment objection of the sort which says, why in the world should we establish such an extraordinary preference for one set of institutions when in fact we deny these kinds of privileges for other persons? So to take, for example, a case which shows the problem, if you take that abominable Supreme Court decision in the Penn Central case, which says essentially that landmark preservation statute is perfectly okay, notwithstanding the want of confiscation when the government seizes air rights, you put state the bomb bomb in this church in an impossible position when it tries to protect its own development interests because it only has the religion clauses to rely upon after all the property defenses have been stripped systematically from it. If you had a world in which the property protections turned out to be strong and turned out to be internally consistent, <coughs> then you would have religion saying, well, all liberty is simply the ordinary deposit of ordinary liberties of ordinary citizens. You don't have to worry about the question of privilege and prerogative when you decide for all particular benefit in this particular case that the government can't do this thing to us unless it's prepared to pay the compensation that it would have to pay to any other property owner. So what I see happening in the United States, given the appalling state of taking this law and all its kindred doctrines, is that all the ordinary liberties, that religious organizations, that press organizations, that all these other special organizations want to have for themselves, are under a short-term and need a long-term siege, because either they claim privilege and prerogative or they're left with nothing at all. If one could reorient the way in which one looked at the Constitution, and recognize that the comprehensive theory that justifies the protection of liberty of religion and liberty of speech 
is exactly the same theory which governs the liberty with respect to the ownership and disposition of property, then we would have a coherent constitution in which we would say that the First Amendment is a clause which we underline, put in red, and give it in the town. And the Fifth Amendment, well, we sort of dot it through and say, occasionally we'll look at it, but for the most part, we will regard it as mercifully obscure. <laughs> <laughs> the last point that I want to make, and then I will stop and leave you all to wiser lines than myself, is to indicate that there's an enormous amount of state given the intellectual development that we've had with respect to the theory of property rights, with respect to the theory of liberty. In my view, it turns out you can't follow a theory which says, well, we'll take some of it and we re reject the other as a matter of principle. It seems to me that you have to understand the Bill of Rights and the underlying theory behind it as fully comprehensive. And once you start buying into one part of the theory, you find yourself driven along in order to accept other parts. And this is what makes the challenge to this particular view of fundamental rights so utterly, so utterly parallel. Because once somebody starts with a different set of fundamental rights, everybody has the same right to a minimum level of income regardless of their ability to produce it, or everybody should be free from any form of invidious discrimination by any other part of the private yeah. association. These rights themselves also tend to show all sorts of hidden and unexpected connections, tend to grow and tend to dominate. So what happens is the theory of interconnection works not only with respect to the good guys, it works with respect, in my judgment, to the bad guys as well, and that you therefore run the danger that the Bill of Rights will slowly become co opted so that it turns out that we will treat under the name of, well, we're going to prevent the abridgment of speech, a duty to subsidize certain individuals who cannot get the wherewithal in the private market in order to express their own points of view. So that when it comes to the question of what we're supposed to do with respect to these fundamental liberties, we are now faced with something which I think is unavoidable in political discourse, but nonetheless has to be fully confronted. Understanding the connections, we tend to face all or nothing decisions with respect to the basic kind of intellectual framework that we put forward. And that tends to put us intellectually into a framework which politically I wish we weren't in, but I think we're in for the long haul of making all or nothing choices instead of having a diffuse market basket of choices in which you can sort of decide things incrementally <coughs> and by small movements. And therefore, Mr. Barr tells us, well, you know, we want the third level to govern the second level, and then is at least openly agnostic as to what it is that the second level is supposed to do. That's the recipe, it seems to me, for long-term disaster. One has to have a strong sense of the theory of the fundamental rights level in order to structure everything that's going to take place at the two subsequent levels. And you can't make those arguments by reciting stuff from Publius anymore. It seems to me, unfortunately, or fortunately, one has to go back and confront more fully than I've been able to do today some of the more fundamental questions of political theory. But there will be no system of non-fundamental rights that will survive. If they're non-fundamental, they may kiss them. Now we'll turn to Professor Ellickson, uh, who's going to discuss affirmative rights and bills of vision. Uh, you mentioned before that. that uh, Constitutional rules of the federal constitution are essentially restraints on uh, federal governments. Uh, the federal government can intervene in the private sphere. But uh, at least in some state constitution, there appear to be affirmative obligations on the part of the government uh, to uh, intervene to some degree <coughs> in the uh, private sphere. That's relevant. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being assigned to speak between uh, Richard Epstein and Bruce Action. <laughs> uh, those of you who've seen them in action know that uh, realistically, I think my role is to provide some sort of ceasefire. Miserable <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, bombardments. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, given my experience as holding professorship of, of natural resources law, which I think is what attracted. Uh, the organizers to assign me to espouse the areas of building uh, I will take on a fairly, uh, fairly ambitious uh, topics about the general structure of built rights. These conceivably will be issues that come up uh, during the rest of the session, and they will raise uh, possibilities about bills of rights, which 
aren't particularly reflected in our own, but, uh, but could be. Uh, the main one I'll talk about is the possibility of having a bill within a bill of rights, a affirmative obligation of government to provide a certain wherewithal to citizens, some goods and services, uh, welfare rights, if you will, uh, that, that might uh, make sense in a well-structured uh, government. Um, uh, this would satisfy uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, identification of one of the basic freedoms would be the freedom from God. The second idea, which is also quite alien to us, or more, even more alien than that one, is the notion that if you believe in civic duties, uh, uh, which the mid do, is that maybe you should list in your constitution not only rights that citizens have, but uh, duties that they owe to the collective. For example, duty to vote would be a fairly mild one. You might also have, for example, the duty to work, and this would imply an obligation on the part of government to pass criminal statutes enforcing these duties, so we might have our bill of rights. Uh, this strikes you as quite bizarre. I can assure you that there are dozens of countries in the world that have just that thing. Uh, thirdly, uh, and this is returning to my main role in federal society affairs, is to be a gadfly on the topic of state constitutions. If you want to develop a theory of bill of rights, you should recall that we not only have a federal constitution, we also have state constitutions. And the interesting question is to what extent? <coughs> Uh, allocate certain protections to your state constitutional list rather than your federal constitutional list. So all three of these things will come up in my remarks, and I'll comprehensively uh, analyze all of them in my minutes. <laughs> uh, you may ask how I'm interested in these uh, topics. Uh, I have taught in the last a few years, been interested in published a little bit even on the issue of the homeless and the law, uh, because one of my major interests has been housing, and uh, it is a staple among homeless advocates is that not only should there be a constitutional right to shelter, but also for most of them there already is a, a constitutional right to shelter if the constitutional wrong is true uh, correctly. And I've had to think about whether that's a plausible claim. Uh, and also, if there, that, that right is not there now, whether or not I would have, my attitude would be for a proposed uh, right to shelter in addition to our constitution. I've actually devoted most of my life to improving shelter, I think, uh, in the United States. And I can tell you that uh, despite that uh, general thrust of the model Act, that I was uh, not in favor uh, adoption of a right to shelter amendment. And uh, basically, my remarks are designed to tell you why. Uh, this uh, specific topic fits into a fairly robust academic literature that I will now very briefly survey, because this is ground that's been trod upon uh, in, the, in the law reviews. Uh, the leading proponent of welfare rights is Frank Michaelman of the Harvard Law School, who over several decades now has been pushing very hard for the proposition that not only are these wise constitutional provisions, but that correctly construed our constitution that grants uh, some minimal entitlements to welfare benefits. Uh, his most persuasive argument uh, is not a raw egalitarianism that motivates uh, some of what he does, but his, his most persuasive argument, I think, is the notion that for a person to be a real citizen, to participate in our political process, they have to have some basic wherewithal, some material wherewithal to be a successful uh, uh, participants. Uh, that if they don't, it's sort of a bad joke to give them the right to vote because uh, they're going to be so poor that any uh, the local mayor or the faction will come around and will have to sell it basically, dirt cheap, uh, and so forth. There's a real slippery slope problem that is, you know, how much wherewithal do you have to give them so that they can really take out the book away and so forth. But anyway, that is the most effective, I think, expression of this proposition. Uh, this has been stated, I think, in my view, but most effectively by uh, Akhil Amar, who will speak uh, uh, tomorrow in a, uh, an article of, uh, uh, prepared for one of the Federal Society uh, programs uh, entitled uh, 40 Acres and a Mule, which cites the uh, program of Thaddeus Stevens during the Civil War about a minimal entitlement of wherewithal to be given to uh, freed slaves and others uh, in the United States. And Akhil again makes this notion of Real citizenship requires that you have some grub stake, if you will, to get going. And that uh, he also uh, concludes that this can be read in our current constitution, as I read him, uh, in the 13th Amendment, and that he will convince himself that I'm right misrepresenting it. Um, there have been critics in the literature of these positions, and they are well represented uh, in our affairs, in, in these uh, proceedings, and they're familiar to most members of the Federal Society. Uh, Robert Bork represents one uh, set of criticism, which is basically that you cannot fairly read the Constitution as conferring these kinds of rights. It's not supported in the text. 
Um, and the Supreme Court seems to be quite firmly of the same view in a series of decisions in the early Burger Court. Uh, they squatted down most of the assertions of welfare rights. The cases are Eldridge, Lindsay against Norman, and uh, the San, Diego, uh, San Antonio School District against Rodriguez. So basically, uh, constitutional um, uh, um, arguments are definitely moving uphill uh, on, on this particular front. People have not tried to kill 13th Amendment argument as far as I know so far. There's another set of critics, uh, which are represented by Ralph Winter, who spoke first, and also by Richard Epstein, who uh, criticized this proposition. Their main, one of their main themes, they make a number of points, is that uh, basically, uh, you've got to worry about incentives here, folks. Uh, that if you guarantee people minimal wherewithal, uh, maybe there's going to be a lot of sloth out of there, the pie will get smaller, uh, and these folks who advocate uh, minimal welfare rights kind of put that under the under the rug. I think that's a very fair phrase is that Michael might be slightly less fair or appeal, uh, who is sensitive to some degree anyway to this uh, uh, to this concern. How will I contribute to this debate? Uh, uh, actually, I have uh, given my background in natural resources law. Uh, some, it's the last time I mentioned that because all my remarks will have nothing to do with that anymore. Uh, <laughs> well, one of the points I want to make that I don't think is in this literature is we have important controls of wherewithal expressly in our Constitution. They are there. Uh, they have not been stressed very much, but they're extraordinarily important, and also I have to support both. One of them is in the 13th Amendment. It is, confers on each individual ownership of their labor. I sometimes say this to my property students, that's not a trivial decision. Labor, human capital, by most economic accounts, represents three quarters of the wealth in our society. Uh, so three quarters of our wealth has been distributed by the 13th Amendment in a constitutional way to individual workers. That is a very basic grub state. If you're interested in giving out grub states, that is worth a heck of a lot more than all the land and all the people. Um, secondly, uh, and more, uh, uh, another form of where it falls is found in state constitutions. I haven't studied, I'm not an expert in education law, I can't swear to you it's found in every state, but I, I don't know of any state where it's not found. And it is the duty of states to, uh, the Constitution is always read, shall provide for a system of common schools. That is a service that young children can demand of government to go into courts and force the provision of uh, uh, What's interesting about that is that, that is a very important entitlement done at the state level. But, and there's been, we had no comparable clause at the federal level, and the San Diego school case rejects any such notion at the federal level, perhaps knowing that in fact there are these provisions at the state level. And notice what that uh, provision does it assures people who have this uh, basic provision of having their own labor also that they have some entitlement to get some training. So, in fact, that their labor, labor will be worth something either to them themselves or on the labor market if they happen to sell it. Uh, those two rights are there. Now, how can you reconcile those two with the kind of criticisms that Ralph Winter and Richard Epstein have mounted? And what's interesting about both those rights is they are not vulnerable to the criticism that Epstein and Winter mount, that conferring those particular goodies do not lead to the problem of swap. You cannot say, I will stay in my hand, and instead of, uh, I will consume my human capital lying in my hammock. Now, I consume my right to education. Those provide no consumptive value at all. They provide value to you only if you want. So basically, those referrals are uh, consistent with uh, inducing work rather than with uh, uh, inhibiting work, and therefore should not be subject to that particular criticism of Epstein and Winter. Uh, so I say these are very ingenious conferrals, and thank uh, that applaud our constitutional system for reaching these particular results. And I know they've not been noticed by the people who've written on this particular uh, topic or particularly commented upon. Uh, why do I oppose a right to shelter? Uh, basically, uh, since we shelter in the United States, it's very broadly provided. I think if we had a right to shelter, it would be largely be a jobs program for lawyers and judges. It uh, would not have much positive effect on the quality of housing in the United States, uh, mostly it would be about the levels of housing and so forth. We have a lot of litigation of this sort in the state of New York, for example, a well-known heartless Cuomo administration is being sued for inadequate welfare benefits in a case called Jiggets, and these kinds of determinations are being decided by the courts of New York rather than through 
the legislative process because we know we can't trust Governor Cuomo and, and company on that kind of uh, uh, issue. So I don't see, I really don't think those issues are, are best out to the court since it's basically the decision on the, on the market. A second narrower question is you're going to provide welfare benefits. Uh, I don't think they should be stated in in-kind terms. It should not be housing, medicine, education, education and special ones, that's a mistake. Uh, housing, food, and so forth. Rather, it should be a general inferral of an income or something like that, rather than having the usual problems of, of uh, possible inefficiencies of in-kind transfer. And thirdly, I think this moral hazard problem, this is my most basic point, is in fact very uh, serious. The criticism that I've seen and wonder about it, that you confer too many protections of this sort, the pie will get smaller is confirmed. And the evidence to show that that is true, I uh, consult a source that may not be consulted for the rest of this conference, but it's a very interesting source that Michael Branston of our law school has helped me pass, which is the constitution of socialist countries. That is, what do, what do the bills of rights look like in the Soviet Union, in Cuba, in the People's Republic of China, and whatever? They had a very long constitution. Uh, their Bill of Rights includes all these affirmative rights of citizens to have housing, medical care, and so forth. They list all this stuff. But it's also interesting is what they also include, and what you have to include, I think, if you're serious about these affirmative, affirmative rights. There are lots of duties listed in those constitutions, and the main one of relevance here is the duty to work, which is expressly list, listed there. Those constitutions also all incorporate from Marx the key formula of, for welfare benefits in those countries, which, uh, as you may know, is two each according to his work. Two each according to his work. It is not an each because that's when we call ourselves communists will do that, but two each according to his work. Social status of John Locke, right there in the Cuban Constitution. You can look it up for yourself. Now, why do they do that? They, in fact, have very serious problems of getting people working. They have constant criminal campaigns against parasites who the people who do not work. Uh, and this seems to be a, a flip side of having all these guarantees of, of welfare. So it looks as if you have all these affirmative guarantees of wherewithal, you are likely to end up with, uh, with uh, something like a police state also enforcing all these duties to work on political terms, I think, is not attractive. I can also tell you, as, as a specialist in housing, that the housing conditions in those countries are abysmal, that poor people who pay them live roughly as well as well to do people do in, say, the Soviet Union or Cuba, that somehow doesn't work as, in terms of delivering uh, goods uh, in the United States. Um, so basically, you know, my, my position here is very upbeat. Uh, we should have a few rights to affirmative benefits, uh, the right to own your own uh, labor, uh, how, uh, schooling, and we've already got them, so we've done a pretty good job. <laughs> Uh, 
not uh, Marx versus Locke, uh, uh, but something else. Uh, now, uh, in the 20th century, um, the fact is, of course, that the, uh, the courts have always had a partial vision of fundamental rights. And the, uh, uh, the interesting uh, thing is how the partial vision has changed over time. Uh, uh, with gross uh, uh, simplification, we'll make the distinction between uh, uh, three uh, uh, moments. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, the uh, Lochner moment, um, uh, is uh, <coughs> the moment of uh, my friend Epstein. Uh, uh, the idea of liberty, fundamental liberty, is understood through the language of property and contract. Uh, and we're assured that if we understand property right, the uh, Roman Catholic Church won't have any trouble at all. Um, but really, what the court is doing is thinking about property and contract. And the fundamental context of human freedom is economics, the market. And other dimensions of liberty uh, are. Um, uh, 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 allowed to situate themselves in the penumbra of this fundamental context of human freedom understood through property and conflict. That's the first period the lawyers would probably call it the period of Lochner against New York, uh, but it's the period of Richie X. The uh, second period, of course, is the period of the state, the New Deal, uh, where, uh, with the overwhelming support of uh, a majority of Americans, people, this structure, familiar and beloved by most of the members of the federal society, was swept away. Uh, and what emerged uh, during this period was statism. The idea that um, um, the, uh, uh, that it was deeply unwise for the protection of freedoms that count to uh, trust to the courts, to uh, the language of property and contract, uh, the idea of free markets. That that was the mistake, uh, uh, and that uh, more freedom, more effective freedom, would be, in fact, fulfilled. Uh, uh, through the uh, political process. In that, we can say that the New Dealers are rather similar to Mr. Barr's federalists, uh, who also thought that in the structure of government and its provision of, uh, uh, of uh, electoral responsiveness, uh, uh, constrained uh, by the institutional mechanisms of government, uh, uh, we would get the most uh, liberty. Uh, this uh, statist vision uh, was in turn uh, um, uh, supplanted by the period which we'll associate with the Warren and Berger reports, because I don't think that uh, they are fundamentally different in, in, in this. Uh, there are variations on the themes, but they're fundamentally different. They're not fundamentally different. And here, the fundamental uh, concept of liberty uh, is uh, uh, not in the market. Um, but in more intimate associations, the family, the church, in fact, um, free exercise is uh, a significant uh, value for these people. Uh, uh, and, uh, the, uh, uh, and it's here where the center is of fundamental freedom uh, and other dimensions of life are, are uh, protected uh, insofar as they're implicated in uh, the uh, uh, protection of uh, family, sexuality, religion. Uh, so let's consider, for example, Bowers against Hardware, which is the case how to do the constitutional right of homosexuals to uh, engage in sexual, um, sexual activity. Uh, this is a case which is identical to Lochner against New York, which is the case of freedom of contract in the first third of the century. But what is the difference? The differences are first that the central context of human freedom has changed 
from the bakery with bake, you know, with, with, with people who are putting their bodies, wanting to move their bodies around in a way that they want and in association with the bake shop owner. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the, and the, um, and the bed. Um, the language of protection is property and contract rather than privacy and free <coughs> association. Um, uh, there are no uh, the, the there are no externalities here. Um, and I've heard <laughs> things to say. There are no children being born by homosexuals. Uh, and uh, there is, of course, the moral disapproval of others unrelated to the enterprise going on. Uh, similarly, there are the there is the moral disapproval uh, of people who are saying, "Oh my God, these people are working too many hours a week." Um, uh, the, um, so these cases are uh, quite apparent. The, um, now, the reason why I say this is because I um, um, suspect uh, uh, that, uh, first of all, uh, many, there are many libertarians in the room who, in fact, see that there is a perfect parallelism between these two cases. Uh, the, uh, and second, to warn these people, uh, because you see these ladies. <laughs> uh, you see, you know, there is a because given the fact that freedom is partial, or in the history of flat change, perhaps you know, we will get to the uh, the perfect country by and by. Uh, uh, because judicially protected freedom is partial, there is. A, there is a, uh, a temptation in this room that goes something like this. You know, this uh, this form, this verb form, protecting freedom of sexual hate. <laughs> um, let's go back to the good old days of which you have to be So this is the way that we will proceed. We are going to assault the right to privacy. We are going to assault the right to uh, free association in the context of freedom which has been established in the last 50 years since that man in the White House had the misfortune of gaining overwhelming support in America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, 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 now uh, you know, it's difficult enough to, 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 to uh, deal with Richie Mumbley in my view. <laughs> There are two liberalisms in this country. 
There's authoritarian and libertarian. Now, um, let's be clear. If you guys destroy the liberties that the Supreme Court and the wreckage you feel that are constructed, if you destroy them and you get the New Deal Court, it's you who should claim responsibility for this period of time. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Now we'll turn to Nadine uh, Strassen. We'll bring a more practical perspective to this discussion. <laughs> discussing, uh, discussing the perspective of the ACLU uh, on the question. Well, I, I too retain the right to uh, adjust my remarks in light of what's gone before. <laughs> uh, this is certainly free speech. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to thank the Federalist Society for this opportunity to participate um, and to congratulate you on what you've done during the past 10 years. It's been my pleasure to speak at many Federalist Society gatherings around the country, and I think one thing your organization has definitely done is to uh, contribute to free speech, free debate, and most importantly, public understanding of, awareness of, and, and appreciation of the Constitution. So that's a, a marvelous contribution. I'm particularly, in the way I must say, I'm jealous at how the Federalist Society has thrived at law schools. I suspect you have far more chapters at American law schools than the ACLU does, and uh, maybe I have to get some organizing techniques with permit uh, before I depart. I, I agree with the rest of the panelists that the question we're dealing with, uh, should the Bill of Rights fully protect fundamental freedoms, is one that I think has to obviously be answered yes. The interesting questions that remain, though, are um, what are fundamental freedoms? Are all fundamental freedoms included in the Bill of Rights? And are all those fully protected, i.e., what does protection consist of? Does it consist merely of non-governmental interference, as some of, my, uh, some of the previous speakers have suggested, or does it consist of affirmative government obligations, as Mr. Ellison has suggested? These basic questions have divided and plagued not only the Supreme Court forever and constitutional scholars forever, but looking at it from more of an activist perspective, I suspect it has uh, engaged the Federalist Society during the past 10 years. These questions certainly have engaged and divided the American Civil Liberties Union during the 71 years of, of its existence. Um, and we have, in order to implement our goal of enforcing civil liberties, which I take to be, although this may not be uncontroversial, I, I will use civil liberties as a synonym for fundamental freedoms. Um, it has been our task and our mission to try to define those and to try to enforce them. Now, one word of disclaimer. Uh, the ACLU is an organization that now consists of approximately 300,000 members. 51 affiliates, many more chapters. Obviously, there is no sane member who would agree with all policies that the ACLU has adopted over the years. And most of the, or many of the positions that are adopted uh, are a product of very vigorous debate, often of very closely split votes on the part of the board of directors and uh, and, and other members of the organization. So there is no monolithic view. There is, however, a general process and a general approach that, that we have gone through. And I think it would be useful to share that with you because it is one, it is one perspective on how one can go about grappling with some of these issues. And I find myself um, strangely agreeing uh, with much that has been said by all of the previous speakers. 
Um, you, that's, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, before this started, Herman Schwartz is also a member of the ACLU, came up to me and, and said something to the effect of, you know, this is very strange company we're in. It's a little bit like Daniel and the Lions Dan. But I find that lately in my academic travels, I am the token conservative because the um, ten, the tendency, the, the trend in academic discourse is so much to the left, and especially uh, in law schools, critical legal studies. I am often the token conservative. It's kind of odd to be the token liberal, but I think that shores up my notion of civil libertarianism as classic liberalism or classic conservatism, choose the term that you will. I was very pleased to hear Judge Winter remark at the outset that there is no inconsistency between being a conservative and being a civil libertarian. I think that is absolutely correct. Now, uh, the first uh, point I want to make is that the civil liberties that the ACLU defends are what would be considered classic political and civil liberties. There is a limited set of rights in two important ways, which have been touched on by previous speakers. Number one, what we're talking about are, um, are, are limitations on government action, negative rights that the government may not interfere with your freedom of speech or of the press and so forth, as opposed to the affirmative entitlements that Professor Ellison has been talking about. The second kind of limitation is that we are talking about civil and political liberties rather than economic, social, and cultural rights or entitlements, as they are sometimes called. And this is as a result of a constant struggle within the organization that has existed since the very beginning when there has been what I would think of as a left wing of the organization that consistently tries to move it in the direction of defending notions such as the right to shelter, uh, the right to government benefits, the right to work, and consistently at a national level, that tendency has been resisted. Um, I think it's interesting to choose as an example uh, to illustrate that kind of debate within the ACLU, the example that Professor Ellison used, which was the right to shelter. There was uh, a voice within the ACLU, a segment of the leadership, that argued on substantive due process grounds, state constitutional grounds, that we ought to advocate an affirmative right to shelter, that every person has a right to, to housing, essentially. And that was, um, that was rejected in favor of a position that focused on the, tra on the traditional classic nexus between political and civil liberties and housing in two respects. Number one, we concluded that to the extent that the government has chosen to get into the housing market through some subsidy programs, and it clearly has, uh, through the tax program, for example, which subsidizes middle class and upper income families in terms of housing through zoning laws. The government, although it had no obligation to do so in the first place, has entered the housing market. We say once it has done that, it must do so in a non-discriminatory, non-arbitrary way that is not penalizing a certain segment of our society, namely the poor. Secondly, we say that to the extent housing is a fundamental prerequisite, I guess this goes in the direction of the Michael in our argument, uh, to the extent that housing is a fundamental prerequisite for exercising basic civil and political liberties, the government must make sure that those rights are not, do not disappear by virtue of not having uh, an address. For example, even though you don't have a house, does not mean you should be deprived of the right to vote, which has happened in many locations in this country. You should not be deprived of your right to an equal educational opportunity simply because you do not have a permanent address. So I think that's a typical example of how the ACLU has resisted uh, the, the push that comes from the left within our own country. And also, I might add, uh, as was indicated by Professor Ellison, uh, typifies 
constitutions of other systems around the world, we've resisted that push toward affirmative economic and social rights, and yet have insisted that poverty and economic deprivation may not be caused by the government or should not be caused by government policies and should also not lead to a deprivation of civil and political rights. I'd like to add a perspective that has not really been touched on here, um, and that is the perspective of international human rights. Not the comparative law perspective that we've gotten from Professor Ellison, but the perspective of those rights that have been widely agreed to by the community of nations through the international, what's called the International Bill of Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Cultural, and Social Rights. Now, the United States has only ratified the first of those three documents. Nevertheless, they are so widely accepted around the world that many international law scholars argue that they constitute customary international law, it's kind of analogous to unwritten common law or natural law in our own system. And I think it's, I want to bring up that perspective because I think it emphasizes how narrow, and I would say classic or conservative, to your terms, uh, it is the American view of rights and the American Civil Liberties Union's view of rights. In the international sphere, people talk commonly of three generations of rights. And I would say we are clearly rooted back in the first generation which had its origin in the 18th century enlightenment. That is political and civil liberties. The second generation of rights recognized widely on the international level are the ones that the economic, cultural, and social rights that Professor Ellison referred to as being commonly recognized in the socialist world. Even that is passe. Much of the developing world and, uh, and many uh, international scholars are now embracing what they call a third generation of rights, which are collective rights to uh, security, peace, development, uh, clean air, clean environment, and so forth. Uh, some people say it's a convenient way to think of this progression, if you want to think of it that way, uh, is in terms of the French revolutionary slogan, liberté, égalité, and fraternité, political and civil liberty, uh, group equality, and finally, collective rights. So I think it is important to have a perspective. I say this uh, in this audience in defense of my position uh, that the ACLU is in fact a very conservative organization. We're not pushing for these um, far-flung definitions of rights. Now, um, I, another point that I'd like to make is that, uh, which is probably obvious, but I think it's, it's worth noting, that to some extent there are inherent tensions among these different levels of rights, uh, to the extent that you are um, really insisting on individual rights, you will be uh, not so protective of group rights or of uh, collective rights. I think that is an inevitable tension and one that is played out uh, over and over again. Uh, I take a firm position, and I think generally the ACLU does too, of emphasizing individual rights. Uh, another point I'd like to make is that civil liberties in the view of the ACLU are not necessarily coextensive with the Bill of Rights. In that sense, I um, agree with a number of previous speakers, including Professor Epstein pointing out and, and, and Mr. Barr pointing out that uh, the mere structure of the government can be a way of protecting and avenue for protecting rights. You don't have to look at the, at the Bill of Rights per se. Um, there are some Bill of Rights provisions that do not cover civil liberties. Um, a classic example, although I'm open to reconsideration on this, but so far I've not been persuaded that the Second Amendment, which protects the right to bear arms in the context of a well-regulated militia, uh, is a matter of civil liberties. Conversely, I think there are many important civil liberties that are not found in the Bill of Rights itself. For example, I, and again, in this context, I speak for the ACLU, would maintain that the post-Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, do protect basic civil liberties. Indeed, I would go further 
uh, and suggest that there's, there are civil liberties with respect to non-governmental entities, certain very powerful actors in the private sector, um, and with respect to which we depend on statutes to protect our civil liberties. Uh, a basic example, of course, is the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibits certain private entities from discriminating on the basis of race, gender, other invidious classifications in employment. I think that is a civil liberty, although it does not derive from the Constitution. And I would also uh, support one of the latest projects of the ACLU, which is to protect workers' rights more broadly against powers of their employers. And I know this is probably making, this is directly contrary to the Abstinian view, no doubt. Uh, but we take the position that uh, given that so many people spend so much of their lives in an in, in employment situation, given the vast economic and practical power that employers have over their lives, to say that employers may deprive employees of free speech, of privacy, of due process, is for all practical purposes to strip those rights from those people altogether. Thank you very much. Uh, I will only express the points on which I disagree with previous speakers. Uh, with respect to Bob, uh, I think that the way in which you talk about the right to education is a little bit too sad and relative to the performance of public education. <laughs> the great tragedy of New York here is that the provision is completely misguided when it talks about the right to provide for common school. It may well be you want the government to fund public school, but you certainly don't want them to run public school. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I think got the argument wrong on the other side, but we stressed only the incentive point, but in fact, those of us who are very suspicious of government power think that the government monopoly point is a real concern as well. And there's nothing worse than a government monopoly running public schools. And I'm proud to say that virtually everyone I know at this table has a good sense to send their children to private schools, precisely because they know what public schools are like, especially in Chicago. So I don't think that people want to say that the affirmative function of government should talk about running these operations. And to the extent that that is a new fundamental right, I think it is deserving of a quick and happy death. Um, <laughs> with respect to Bruce, um, I think it's wonderful the way Bruce managed to mistake my position and therefore put me in company with two people from whom I've taken enormous pains to dissociate myself at every possible occasion, both public and private. I am not a friend of intellectually, not personally. Intellectually, a part more, Nina Scalia's, or Justice Rehnquist. And indeed, when I gave this particular speech, I did not use the word property and contract. I quite consciously chose the words liberty and contract with respect to the fundamental rights, precisely because liberty of action covers far more than the contractual sphere. All that is certainly a part of it. And when I chose the examples, anticipating where Bruce would be coming from, I chose two examples, neither of which dealt with economics narrowly conceived. One had to do with the press, and the other had to do with respect for religious freedom. So I think that the right way to understand what's going on about this is to recognize that there is indeed a common intellectual framework that has to apply to the intimate personal rights that are spoken of in the modern court and in the classic economic rights. The question is whether they come out with the same result. And here I think that Bruce is right about the framework may be wrong. It's an enormously complicated question about the consequences. That is, if I thought that the, the, the homosexuality question only involved privacy in the bedroom, I would say, of course he's right. But to the extent that it involves publicity in the bathhouse, to the extent that it involves the transmission of AIDS, you've got a good old-fashioned externality around there, which is equal to that of the nuclear reactors. And the question as to whether or not God is completely silent on that question is a much more difficult one, and on which you will find that the question of showing an externality doesn't mean that you want to regulate it, but by the same token, it doesn't mean that you could ignore it entirely. So I think the framework is constant, but there may be reasons why, at least with respect to some aspects of personal freedom and so forth, people are nervous without being training it, and that that is a delicate subject that you have to answer the opposite.
well, in some in some much more expensive setting. The last one, uh, Lady Strauss, I mean, we have to follow and disagree. I think that civil liberties are in mortal tension with respect to civil rights, and that the reason why the ASO has never gotten my membership is that it has basically got a split personality. And now, what does the split? I mean, there's two very brief examples. One with respect to the zoning situation. What the ACLU's position is we see one imperfection which makes the world impossible, say, in zoning. We're going to make it worse. We're going to have zoning, and we keep that, and then we're going to have this non discriminatory stuff thrown on top, and you get the Mount Laurel morass. The only respectable position is to say, when you make a fundamental blunder, don't try to augment it by a second. Work with more of a to get rid of the imperfections in the zoning system rather than to add on a poverty confusion to a zoning catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> Sheer blunder is the equation of public employers and private employers. Title VII is, in my mind, absolutely antithetical to uh, any conception of civil liberties and freedom of association. It should be repealed forthwith. And the reason why we see the tension is that she assumed that just because you're an employer, you're a big. The theory of government is not going to size its monopoly power that's at stake. And so long as you can go elsewhere for a job, it's just not a question as to whether you like or dislike this term is one of public concern. The risk that one sees with government in all these cases is when I don't like the draft, there's no other place that I can go in order to do my military service. And when you don't like government regulation, there's no way you can do it safe and sure the will. And so long as we start hearing that economic size is the same of government power, everything the civil liberties union stands for is going to be wholly perverted. So what they have to do is essentially chuck 90% of their program and go back to the good old fashioned stuff of protecting unpopular dissent against majoritarian impulse. And for the rest of it, they're part of the problem, not the solution. <laughs> Constitution and, 
in a healthy kind of way. I'm exaggerating a little bit, not all that much. And uh, so I, I would hope uh, Gish did it because the other uh, uh, members of this panel or other panels have some theory about uh, the kinds of provisions that might appear in state constitutions as opposed to the federal constitution.
let me uh, start on a relatively light note. I appreciate um, Bob's kind of comments about me. I respectfully disagree, showing my civil libertarian streak with his uh, comment about kissing. I think you have a right to express <laughs> Uh, a few days ago, I was in New Orleans at uh, what I used to call Tulane University. I was corrected and told that it's actually called Tulane. Uh, at Tulane University, debating Ed Meese and Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly began to speak a little bit uh, at, at, at a loss because apparently it was one of the rare occasions where students had not interrupted her from heckling, so she actually had to say something. <laughs> What she proceeded to do was to describe to us all of the, to me, fascinating ways in which students had uh, interrupted her. He said, it's nothing, believe me. Um, there was one audience in which the students uh, all belched throughout her entire life. <laughs> My favorite, the one which I'm sort of sorry has never happened to me, is uh, at one university, the students all script uh, while she's so Anyway, that's a uh, express your reactions in any way you see appropriate. Now, getting to the substance that I guess um, the many people have to respond to in terms of um, criticisms of the ACLU are, are Bob and, uh, as Bruce calls him, Richie. <laughs> Interesting, I keep hearing this that the ACLU used to be a good and pure organization back in the good old days, who knows when that was, uh, when it was only defending free speech. Um, and then we took a wrong turn by uh, recognizing that there is more in the Bill of Rights than free speech. And I suppose uh, what Richard is particularly objecting to is our discovery of the post-Civil uh, War amendments, which as I told you, I and the ACLU do consider to be part of the Constitution, part of the Bill of Rights. Um, among other things, they made the original Bill of Rights enforceable against the states and local governments, something which I think is crucial in terms of everybody's individual freedoms. Uh, for another, they do talk about values of equality. And it's interesting, Richard has some strange out fellows on the left who also argue that there is an inherent tension between civil liberties and civil rights. I reject that. I think that is a false dichotomy. Uh, it comes up in many contexts. The one in which it has most recently been debated, which should be familiar to many of you, and that is the controversy over free speech on campus. In particular, the question whether students and faculty members should be allowed to make uh, particular offensive remarks, namely racist remarks, homophobic remarks, or I should say remarks that can be perceived as racist, sexist, and homophobic, because I think we all know there is a climate where those words are bandied about rather freely. And uh, the ACLU, I'm proud to say, after vigorous debate, came out with a unanimous vote of an 83 person board of directors. Uh, in my experience, uh, there's never been a unanimous vote. Your own Professor Brown has been on the ACLU National Board far longer than I have. Brown, well, there's never been a unanimous vote before that, has there? Well, I don't think of no. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we would oppose censorship of speech, no matter how hateful, how offensive, despite enormous pressures uh, from civil, some civil rights organizations and some uh, segments of the civil rights community uh, in the service of their view of equality. And I believe very strongly that equality as well as free speech would be undermined by those codes. And a number of leaders of civil rights organizations have made the same point. Namely, that it is paternalistic and patronizing and demeaning to suggest that they alone in our society cannot withstand the slings and arrows of free speech, including offensive speech. So I think that's a false dichotomy. In terms of Richard's second point, uh, I'm sorry, Richie's second point, uh, that Title VII should be repealed and only the government has uh, sufficient power to deprive individuals of liberty, 
I guess, in a way, this goes back to the point that Bruce was making, um, that, that, that Richie had some um, idealistic view of destroying the whole governmental apparatus that exists now. And I think he's just simply ignoring reality uh, to ignore the fact that we do have a welfare state, we do have a government which has massively intervened in the economic arrangements and social arrangements under which we live as a consequence of government actions. There are private agglomerations of power, especially in terms of employers, and that we should not allow the government through its agents to deprive individuals of basic rights. Thank you. and was one of the dominant sources, proper sources, with respect to government regulation. When one deals with the question of AIDS, the most difficult problem epidemiologically is that the diseases have to have its greatest effect under those circumstances where people are ignorant of its existence. And to the extent that you have elaborate networks with respect to transmission, there is a serious technical, biological, externality of the sort that was recognized in the 19th century. To sort of ignore that and to pretend, well, this is now a straight civil liberties issue, is to ignore the externality problem, to take it into account as exceedingly troublesome, to sort of sit there and look down to somebody of moral indignation seems to me to be wholly misguided because what it does is it tends to make simple an issue which is hard. Now, what about what? The evidence on that particular case is exactly the opposite of the way in which he was referred to. The statute in that situation was one which was introduced by the unions in New York as an effort to try to suppress the competition which were given by German immigrants. One of the things that about it was an alien statute. It was designed to be related to competitive forces. It was a situation of powerful government agencies trying to stop others. And the reason they didn't find an eight hour of the town or work day was not because there was exploitation in the firm, but because people used to sleep on the job and therefore they worked much longer hours. It was a way of having differential impact where you could wipe out the competitors and comply yourself fully with the regulations at hand. So it seems to me that when we actually look at this stuff, we can't let ourselves be diluted into the sort of nice ship of which says that once we're talking about it, everything is going to be absolutely protected. I wish I could say that, and certainly with respect to most of these issues, I would fight very hard on that particular side of the line, given the fact that I do not think that the existence of an externality is sufficient justification for government regulation. And the question of means and ends has to be held. I don't think it's any change in the position that I've taken. Generally, it's the same position I took with respect to takings when one starts to talk about the other various forms of externality. And if one wants to treat this as sort of a, a simplistic, natural, self evident question of right, it means that the whole issue of public health, which has vexed us for so long, will be systematically misunderstood. So I would plead for a moment of caution. If we had other times, I would be quite happy to go into the epidemiology of this stuff in some way, since I did spend, on what they perhaps wish to know, an enormous amount of time trying to figure this out. And it turns out to be a much more sober and difficult tale than most of us would, I think, like it to be. Symmetry and, uh, uh, and Richie's remarks. Uh, Richie and I go back uh, 30 years. <laughs> Not a 20 
Stalinistic role, just as perhaps or perhaps not. Uh, the, uh, the labor unions played a, uh, a cardinalizing role. And if we're going to talk about the epidemiological evidence, obviously, we should uh, talk about the evidence of public health having to do with working 80 hours a week. Now, I do also want to, the second point has to do with uh, the abuse of the notion of externality. Externality is, so far as I'm concerned, uh, an unbargain for impact on third parties. Imperfect information is what Richie is trying to get at, which isn't, in my understanding, externality at all. And the question is, of course, whether <laughs> should um, uh, take the, you know, try to obtain the information they think is relevant uh, before engaging in homosexual activity. There are many risks, right, engaging in any kind of sex. And I do, uh, I am surprised, and I would, would invite you to consider Richie's consideration of imperfect information in normal contracts, which, of course, he's a very, I mean, he's taking a lab uh, uh, steps on that uh, in the old freedom contracts of the and ask yourself whether the kind of imperfect information about um, the biological constitution of an intimate partner, as to whom naturally you would know much, much more than, for example, the kinds of features of an automobile which, uh, or something of this kind, are generally employed by the as a patient for paternity. Just to have a third voice on this particular debate, I think Bruce has made a strong case that I agree with that those two cases have to be decided the same way. Uh, I would decide to both sustain myself as a federal judge, sustain greatly, and so whatever. Uh, whatever. Uh, I would like to just disagree on the missing issue, and this is simply a terrible <laughs> Teacher of some years, uh, whether students come to me uh, complaining more about being suppressed because they've been hissed, or whether they come to me uh, complaining that their hissing has been suppressed. And I think there's been none of the, of the latter case, there have been uh, uh, some number of the former case. And in my view, there's invariably no question if you want a robust revelation of dissident views in the classroom of the anti hissing uh, and that is your policy, it is your policy, and I think I would actually defer to experienced teachers this afternoon to make consensus on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the empirical evidence that you cite cuts the other way. Because I'm concerned about those students who are so chilled that they wouldn't even come to the professor to complain and can only hear to express themselves through the anonymous. <laughs>
Similarly, at some stage, right, you're going to have a right to shelter tried in the United States. I would rather have a trial in the, at a sub federal level. It was tried, I can tell you, this is the Columbia of 2005 referendum repealed by the same voters uh, several years later. But that was a less costly experiment to take place at the sub federal level. I think that's in New Hampshire and Vermont have very different states in Italy, and uh, maybe that should be reflected in the Constitution more than it is. Okay, are there any questions for the commissioner? Well, I was very interested in Professor Ellison's um, discussion of the 13th Amendment. It's the 13th Amendment seems to be distinct in this respect. First of all, it's a state action requirement. And second, it's almost that it's in line with the Second Amendment to be enforced, at least often by the courts. It's hard to find case law that expansively interprets the involuntary servitude provision of the 13th Amendment. And I was going to ask Professor Ellison whether he was in favor of a more expansive definition of Interpretation of 13th Amendment's voluntary servitude, such that it might, for instance, cover such things as very unequal bargaining power situations, uh, situations <coughs> either left or right. You can see Robert Joseph saying that the 13th Amendment would ban income taxes. You can see a, a more liberal philosopher saying it should enforce the provisions of the National Labor Relations Act. I was wondering if you would like to see more activist interpretation of the 13th Amendment in American jurisdiction. Well, it's a fair question, and it is certainly the case that if you ever recognize any of these affirmative endowments, you're going to have a lot of problems with the margin and figuring out which of the clauses that is, that is offered. They already, there is some litigation over the call for 13 minutes about the draft, about jury duty, and so forth. And the courts have by and large sustained the other things because the courts have been able to decide it. I certainly would not go as far as. Uh, as uh, uh, is knocking out uh, uh, most taxes on income and those, and those other sorts of uh, those, those really uh, uh, that you suggest. I think to some extent there is some core that doesn't create a lot of mischief. I think it's I think it, I regard it as um, in some ways a good thing that you had so little uh, litigation over it. Uh, that shows that there is some core that's being protected, which is very fundamental. That uh, uh, that is not created all that much problem with the margin. Is one thing I do worry about whenever you create these things is there'll be this tremendous volume of litigation that will just waste a lot of the brains of our nation and not uh, result in a whole lot of substantive uh, benefit. So it strikes me this is a, another reason why I like the 13th Amendment. I'd like to point out that there's been some academic support. I, to the best of my knowledge, no judicial support yet for uh, using the 13th Amendment to defend and expand reproductive freedom rights. Yes, sir. Uh, in listening to uh, Professor Epstein and Professor Acton here, at, at a certain moment, I had, I had a sense that I was listening to Tweedledee and Tweedledown and utilitarians. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. If, if somebody in Yale and Haven decided that the, uh, the effect, the public health effect, of 70 hour work week in a, in a bakery, was exactly the same, exactly the negative consequences as the uh, uh, the relationship of, of homosexuals and the privacy of their bedroom. Uh, would there be any fundamental? Would there be any uh, rule that you could that you would uh, discriminate between, say, the, the right to privacy uh, and the, uh, 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 the right of contract? Uh, I don't know if I'm making myself oh, clear, but it seemed to me that you're both ultimately making a utilitarian argument. And the difficulty in the question is whether or not those are strong enough to get into certain kinds of law. And I think in the bedroom, I basically be seemingly hostile to them, but with respect to the more rapid transition that can take place by the parties, in some senses, but not in another, uh, I'm much more troubled by the whole situation. And I think it's a, a question that one has to face more candidly. Would this world have been better if somebody had passed this? Some major city or all major city, a statute to close down all bathhouses in 1970, 10 years before without any knowledge. The moment you know about a disease, the knowledge is a thing. With respect to the public health side, I'm willing to look at the evidence that we've said on both sides. And I think with respect to Locker on the basis, this stuff is extraordinarily thin with respect to the health effects of this stuff that they went over in some detail. Um, Justice Harper tried to make that argument as he said, essentially went back to the babies of 1614 in France in order to try to make some appropriate parallel, which I think shows the weakness with respect to the case. And the reason I talk about a public choice model under those circumstances, if you show an anti-competitive voter, it tends to weaken the side with respect to health. But if you can show fundamental, fundamental unknowns of the same magnitude in that case as you could in the other, then I think I put conceptually distinguish between them. 
it's the empirical subject that I think leads to very different results. So just to put it very simply, you would agree that there's no fundamental freedom uh, of contract, no fundamental right to privacy. No, I think I agree that they both ran as a diet. Um, and uh, I'm a strong, I regard myself as a strong libertarian. I'd like to be an absolute one, but over the years, I, I've sort of been forced to give up 5% of my deepest health to the strength of overwhelming evidence. That's one of the problems. <laughs> and the other problem is the coordination problem is the topic of freedom, which I think one tends to change. So I mean, there I sit, the very solutions. Well, in, in uh, social justice and liberal state, I quite explicitly uh, come out both for freedom in the bedroom and freedom in the market. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's amusing to find that the two uh, uh, federalists in this crowd uh, are statists. Uh, Richie Epstein says, it doesn't explain how this state is going to assist, uh, assess this empirical evidence you know, and come down hard on the one that and the other. Uh, the, uh, uh, and Bob Ellison uh, uh, said that he was with me that there was a fundamental parallel between the two cases. And he would be a status judge. He would say the states do both. Do you think that all between the role of judge uh, and the role of legislator and political deciding to, do you I mean, anticipate my assessment of the merit of the regulation uh, in question? Of course, the, the, uh, this is the New Deal refrain that um, uh, you're giving us. That is to say, the judges are uh, afflicted by a counter majoritarian difficulty, and they are. Uh, uh, and uh, that disables their protection of fundamental liberty. Back. I'd like to ask Professor Ashton a question. Along the same line, the little justice, the lead of action. A little uh, Justice Scalia bashing with remarks and characterize Justice Scalia as a statement, which uh, given his opinion in a case like Morris would be also kind of hard for me. I think Scalia uh, really ignored the methodology of Justice Scalia, which is a methodology that is really designed to avoid what I view as the ultimate statement, which is rules being created, uh, constitutive rules that can't be changed except by supermajority. Uh, being created out of thin air with no uh, community input. And so I don't view Scalia uh, as a statist, that his opinion in Morris is going to indicate that he's not going to bow to the state's structure, he's going to use the structural provisions of uh, separation of powers to defend against state power. Uh, he's a textual formalist, and I think that's a methodology that, in fact, is non statist. The modern courts methodology is very stated because nine unlikely people in Washington, D.C. determine policy for the well, well, I do. I do certainly agree that there are two fundamental strategies that have to be in one way or another coordinated. There is the power constraining strategy, uh, uh, and separation of power is one of those techniques. Then there's the right to protect, right to protecting strategy. Uh, and uh, I do protest uh, against uh, uh, this, uh, the constitutional status of this kind of formalism. Uh, the Ninth Amendment is the only method that is addressed to uh, a, uh, uh, a methodological technique. And it says that you cannot view the Bill of Rights as an exclusive limit. And therefore, anyone, I'm not sure whether it's Scalia, I, I, I think that's just we would have to question where Scalia is sitting there. But anyone who, said, who looks upon the Bill of Rights as a list is in violation of the Constitution of the United States. There's an exclusive fix with the violation of the Constitution of the United States. The question rather is whether it's the concept of privacy or the concept of property or something. We wish how to fill in the right that. That's a fair question. But the Klein Amendment is part of the Constitution. I was a little confused because the man behind you there said that, that this first he didn't want the amendments. You know, but also he said it would be very confusing to tie up an unanswerable right with the Bill of Rights, which is a limitation, only a limitation. 
and alienable rights, which are made with the Congress by the government. I don't see anybody drawing the difference, the fundamental difference. I don't see you answering Madison. We shall wish wildly. Madison said there are three kinds of rights. One are not right at all. A right from the Constitution is not a right. It's a privilege. You know that. No, I don't take it away. Well, it can be taken away, so it's a privilege. I got that right here at jail from Hoka some years ago. The unalienable right can't be touched. That's recognized by the Declaration. It talks about unalienable rights. Oh. And then here's your third kind of right, which is which is a limitation, the true bill of rights. And I'm just talking from that. The true bill of rights is was the Bill of Rights in England, which limited, which limited the king. Now, these are fundamentally different, and you can't mix them up. And that's what he said. You mix them up, and then you say to the defendant. Who wants to take that? Dr. Roger, uh, I, mean, I think the answer is yes, there are certainly rights that are not subject to agreement, and there are others that are. The concern that all of us have is how one tries to draw a coherent list and puts things on one side or another. I would want to look at the issue in a somewhat different way. When I talk about economic liberties and religious liberties, there is, I think, an important distinction between them, which tends to favor the strong protection of religious and then economic liberties. I think if you take away liberties of the economic variety, you can say that you provide just compensation, I will trust the state, not that I like it, but I'll trust it to try and figure out how that can be done, and I think taxation forms into that model. But I think other rights, like those of religious liberty, are much less subject to bargaining and removal under these circumstances. So that what I would try to indicate is that the class is not between inalienable and alienable rights, rights and privileges. It's those rights which are protected by strong property rules, and those rights which are protected essentially by damage limitations of compensation mechanisms. And I think if we had more time to talk about it, we would start to figure out exactly how various rights fall under that heading. But that's, I, I think in this talk, we just never got to the question of, of the finance of public good. And if we did, I don't think, again, there would be violent disagreement amongst the three and a half or two. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. I'd like to make two points. One, we don't want to settle uh, important disputes by using a label like status. But it seems to me that the press activists will not be doing that, at least taking a lot of solace and support from hurling this, uh, I'm glad that it's the public majority, and it really has, for hurling the word status, to my amazement, at Orr and Scalia and Rehnquist, who are three people who clearly favor minimalism in government. Now, state as it means anything, means encouraging the big state. Now, these are three people who very much oppose you or on the opposite pole from you in terms of the scourge. These are minimal law people. You know, they have less antitrust law, less anti-discrimination law, less state. Now, to win an argument, we can make points by yelling status at them, it really is the truth. <laughs> You want to answer that first grade? Well, I'm glad I attracted your attention. <laughs> <laughs> that was my attention. But uh, there's, I'm, I'm, of course, talking about their constitutional philosophies, not um, uh, other dimensions of their philosophies. When Bob Moore uh, explains why a flag burning statute is perfectly constitutional, that statism, of course, you would vote against it as a legislator, but I was talking about this philosophy as a judge. When Willie Rehnquist write this absurd dissent, uh, lacking all sense of legal craft in a flag-burning case, that's statism. Nothing else. Of course, perhaps, I don't know whether you're right, by the way, about Rehnquist. Uh, maybe you would have voted against it in the, in the legislature. I'm not so sure. Now, uh, uh, of course, you know, philosophies are complicated. Uh, but on the constitutional side of things, I think it's pretty clear that Bill Brennan, who is for individual rights, no, well, uh, and... No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's one of my points, of course. That is sometimes thing. And uh, uh, every month I would like <coughs> to have a law with protected economic freedom and session freedom. It seems to be very Pickwickian to get to the second by the destruction of the first. Yeah. Not to debate that. It does seem to me, before I get to my second mark one, <laughs> it does seem to me that you make that argument only by insisting that there really is nothing of significance in the position that one distinguishes and one favors democracy. That it is not statism to say that if the people of New York State wish to ban the, eight, the 10 hour day, uh, I, Bob Bork, certainly, I think his philosophy is against that more than most people on the left, that he's against that, uh, as much as perhaps as uh, Richie is, uh, like a factor of almost as long. Uh, but you know, all he's saying is that we're, we're denying the validity of this saying that the, this is a decision that, as much as I think is wrong, is really to be left to the people. And for, for, and for you to say that if Bork is unwilling to have people like Brent and Blackman they interject and correct what the people do with statism, which again, I think they're misused the word. They, they, their position is they favor representative government. On the merits, they dislike big government more than you do. If I make it, the second point is, I must say, I have discouraged to hear a professor of law at Yale say the Ninth Amendment is also in the Constitution. Yeah. And more, and even more disturbed to find students at Yale, I don't have better sense, clapping that, applauding at that. I mean, what is the thrust of that argument? The Ninth Amendment happens to say only, is only a rule of how, what should not be. Right? It just says, these shall not be interpreted. Now, if we are going to take that as an affirmative plan of power to judges, to disallow legislation, on the grounds there are other rights which they will find, there is no way that we should recognize as minimally sophisticated people that we are simply turning over a huge, unlimited area of policy making to those judges. I really don't see that seems to be such completely and, and doing it would still maintain the idea that they're interpreting the Constitution. You know, which really is unsophisticated. The whole Harvard and Madison idea is judge witnesses. The Constitution says something, it's law, and we have to enforce it. It says you need two witnesses, the statute says one, we gotta say you need two. And then to, to, to build on that, then there's the Ninth Amendment which says, don't interpret these others in a certain way. You say, now what that means is there's lots of other rights. Judges can find them and disallow legislation on the reason. Now, if minimal sophistication is that that is a prescription for government by judges, and the only thing we're discussing now is, is that a better form of government? Okay, yeah, confrontation, that's it. 
Then it goes right down and then says, and that's all folks at the Eighth Amendment. Now that's inconsistent with the Ninth Amendment. Then we'll talk about what sophisticated people should do, but not that. One second. Yes, the strange of the federal society. Not that the Chiefs are a great circle of the flag and then the extent that the only externalities are of what other people do. I just can't see how that, that counts. And of course, it seems to be that it basically is a constitutional protected right of the court of the First Amendment. But with respect to Robert Lena's position, look, it's probably to say it like this. You can't stop the numbers working away. I do think it says that. But when you try to read number nine, there are these two little constraints. You don't want to do something that nine is going to be inconsistent with something which takes place in one of the day. I think to me that that's a perfectly important and sensible restriction on the way in which you can screw the substitute freedoms that, that does something to limit what's going to happen to prevent this thing from becoming a wild and open ended view. But the second thing is more tricky. But it, it seems to me that one of the things that Bill Barton did is look, We've got a consistent view of what government is like when we start thinking about limited government and government powers and factions and so forth. And what you want to do is to take that philosophy, sort of apply it to the existing age, and see how, by careful analogy and extension, you can get something else that might want to cover it. I think that's a perfectly sensible affirmative regime, which respects to this traditional principles of construction. And the question of what's going to yield, I guess it probably does yield to something like we will put on my civil libertarian side again without the epidemiological you know, complication. I mean, I'm pretty confident about that one, because I don't need any of it. But we were anybody else said, you know, that the externality problem of this world is just non existent in the way in which one defines it. So, you know, all these things that I think you can do it. Actually, we want to talk about the externality in Griswold, which is to talk about the policy considerations. No, 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 no. I suggest to you that if the court can interpret not only the Bill of Rights, but what it discovers in the benevolence brought by the emanations thereof, <laughs> it is not in any, any sensible sense of recognition. I'd like to say to Professor Hackerman that you say if the majority gets their way in incrementing rules to the government, that's stated. And of course it is, that's government. But the only alternative to the majority is the minority. You know, there are nothing else but people. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, the theory about it is we're trying to show us with respect to this so that the technology is on a private individual decision as opposed to making everything the question of collective choice. And when one understands that at that point, the need for control of level number two by level number three becomes much more powerful and much more insistent. So to sort of sit there and to assume that, well, at the moment we do this, we're going to go to excess and change forms of construction that have never been before. It's wrong. Let me give you an example of the penumbra strategy which calls that innovation. Read the last and pull it sometime. This modernist device by the Roman Jewish with respect to the skull of the Torah. In a section, when they talk about the actual factor and the actual do the stuff I teach my spare time in the Roman law, they are received by emanations and by improvements. And what they did is that the statute says you can't kill somebody by cutting his head off, you can't kill him by poisoning it as well. There's nothing in the statute. In fact, any anthropological examination of a would say that poisoning is excluded. But even back at the time when judicial activism was on nobody's mind, nobody's mind, I must never be judged who was prepared to say that you could not have some cases of use of generous, some parallelism, some incrementalism. And it seems to me that what one ought to do is to understand that the United Amendment is a kind of invitation to do with the Constitution what the Roman jurists did with the likes of Polly. And I think it works pretty well. Richard, that is the amount of sophistication that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that realizes that the laws cannot be perfect and absolute. And obviously, if you have a rule that says you can't kill by cutting his head off, that might have some bearing on killing by poisoning. And to go from that to say you have a rule that says you have a right to bear arms to you have a prohibition of controlling homosexuality is not in the same ballpark. <laughs> I didn't make that leap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed that you know it. Let the professor know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I really don't have it. <laughs> uh, 
I would like to talk about the use of the word statism to give you a little further history. Uh, I have written groups of people uh, that at every page I can uh, for being statist. And what I mean by it is the definition that we just used, which is group has, uh, in my judgment, overdue confidence and uh, over, overconfidence in the ability of government agencies to conduct uh, build habits or you know, regulate industries and so forth. So I read them at every opportunity, and I got to them, I think. Actually, because I had a grant where I said, this thing is such a bad food accident, and I, I thought, <laughs> I, 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 I've done too much. I, I, I thought this was, I'd just gone too far, so I took it out of the morning. You mentioned the grant here, but that was at the board states. Uh, now, so I thought, so I'm taking pleasure here, that I got to work essentially on this. Uh, and it was, however, a uh, uh, on the legislative policy side. And it's possible somebody is quite committed to keeping the side of government down, but also have, regrettably, some large, uh, another principle which trumps that very, very important belief, which has to do with the separation of powers of one of the parties. And so, and, uh, 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 I think the use of the word state is, is normally to talk about my attitude on the legislative side, and I thought I would give you this additional history that Bruce's use of this word now as a expletive, like, I regard as a personal success. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this is for Professor Epstein. <laughs> um, mention was made of the prospect of you being appointed to the Supreme Court. <laughs> the Supreme Court issues about 150 opinions a year, and, and I ask you how you could realistically expect to write 150 dissents per year. <laughs> I'm not a new player, Todd. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 